you have your Bible, again, join me back in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter number 24. And uh, one of the blessings that I have in my life was that uh, being under preaching uh, men who believe that the Lord is coming. And He's coming soon. I mentioned before that as a teenager when God called me to preach, uh, that was on a Wednesday night in May of 1969, I went into the pulpit for the very first time. I'd given a few devotions and stuff, but actually to be able to preach, the pastor and the associate pastor uh, was out of town, and, and uh, me and yet another young man were able to preach on that Wednesday. And he didn't show up, so uh, instead of 15 minutes, I had 30. I think I preached 12. And uh, I don't remember, I don't think it was very long. But anyway, uh, the message that I had was on the second coming of Christ. And uh, I believe uh, from 1969 to the day that Christ is coming, and He's coming very soon. And I don't know when, and neither do you, nor Harold Camping. I say that a lot. People say, who's Harold Camping? Anybody know he's a big radio preacher out of the States, and uh, he has a great following. Uh, of people on the radio, and yet uh, he uh, has has said several times when Christ was going to come, and he's he's not come. Uh, back, I remember back in the 80s, uh, there were those preachers, some popular and some not so popular, uh, that was preaching that Christ was going to come in 1988 or 87, and they was looking at Israel becoming a uh, nation in four, uh, 1948, you know, uh, that a generation that Christ is going to come back, and they, they all tried that. You know what? He's not come back. But notice what the Scripture says here, and Jesus is speaking here in uh, Matthew chapter 24. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and His disciples came to Him for uh, to shew, himself, shew Him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, See, in, uh, in not all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be torn down. And Jesus is making a prophecy here of something that was going to take place within 70 years. Uh, because the Roman leader, Titus, is going to come in and he's literally going to take the temple apart brick by brick, stone by stone, and it's going to be taken all apart. So as Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, uh, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the end of the world? You know, they were asking, what is it that they would be able to know? What signs that was given? What wonders are going to be taking place so that we would know that uh, you are going to come again. It's going to be a, a time of the end of the world. And when are these things that are going to be taking place? And so Jesus begins a long discord. It takes uh, chapter 24 and 25 in the discourse here. If you have a, a red letter edition Bible, you'll see that uh, chapters uh, 24 and 25 is nothing but uh, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking and such as He makes this long discourse there uh, to His uh, di disciples there and, and a turn to you and I as well. But make note here in verse number 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now He said this to the men that had been following Him for about three years. Men that He's eaten with, men that he's, He has uh, uh, camped out with, men that He has spent a lot of time with, that they got to know the Lord Jesus Christ personally and see the miracles that He did and everything that He accomplished. And He, he says to them very simply, take heed that no man deceive you. Because there's one thing that God wants you and I to know, and that's the truth. He wants you and I to know the truth. He wants us to know the truth about everything. 
Pilate asked, what is truth? Jesus makes it very plain that He is the way, the truth, and the life. We also see that Thy Word is truth. So truth is all around us in that we can understand and we can know the truth, and the truth will make us free. The freedom that you and I can have and enjoy in our Christian life and in our Christian walk comes from the truth that God has for us. But we need to be aware, as Jesus said, take heed, pay attention, uh, walk circumspectly, that's being very careful, that no man deceive you because there are deceivers that are in the world. There are those who try to deceive and work at deceiving. Uh, they're all around us. Uh, not just dealing with Christianity or dealing with religion or dealing with the spirituality, but there are deceivers everywhere. I just saw uh, on uh, the uh, uh, one of the YouTube that somebody had sent me how that these guys, they got the uh, clerk attention uh, and getting them packs of cigarettes and, and cigars and stuff. And when they did, one of the other guys flipped a, uh, a little uh, plastic thing over the... Uh, uh, the uh, point of sale where you push in, you slide your card and you push in your slide number and everything and they slipped that over and it was there so that the customers that would come in, they would run their cards through there and it would work fine, but that little plastic thing they put there was to get their information, their, uh, their number, uh, their tracking and their PIN number as well and it's a deception and, and the guy saw it on video and caught it before any of their customers. But there are people out there who deceive you in many ways. Uh, there is deceptions a uh, uh, big time uh, when people go to rent a house. People rent houses out that they don't own. And uh, they, they'll, they'll uh, have somebody come to a vacant house and they'll take their money and people will move in and people say, what are you doing moving in? You don't own this one. Well, I rented it from so and so and they, they don't know. There's deception that is out there everywhere. Uh, Young people need to be aware of deception. The elderly need to be aware of deception. That the, the telephone calls that come in. Uh, there used to be one we used to get. Wah, you want a cruise, you know? And uh, uh, all these that come. So deception is everywhere. And but God gives us warning. Christ here, He says to him very simply. He says, "You need uh, to take heed uh, that no man deceive you." So Christ. Himself gives many signs concerning His coming. They ask, what shall be the sign of thy coming? What shall be that wonder that is there? And He says to them, as He begins to give them some of the many signs, He said, take heed that no man deceive you, because they needed to know the truth. And it's the same with you and I. But then He gives us some things here to look at. He says in verse number 5, For many shall come in My name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. One of the things that he brings out is that there are going to be false Christs, false messiahs, false people who are going to consider themselves the anointed one of God. And Jesus is talking, and, and right after His death, His burial and resurrection, there were people that was rising up and trying to get a following after them. And of course, uh, uh, over in the book of Acts, I believe it's chapter 5, it talks about a couple of men that had great followings. And uh, the, uh, uh, the lawyer said they came down to nothing, they came to naught. And if these men are followers of Christ, if Christ is uh, of Jesus, if He's not real, they'll come to naught as well. But we know that they didn't. Because those that were followers of Christ, the Bible says they turned the world upside down. Now, I believe the Bible that they turned the world upside down, but I think they really turned it right side up to know Him. <laughs> but the Bible says they turned the world. They made a change. They, they, they made a difference. If there are false Christ and false prophets, look at verse number 23 if you would. Then if any man say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall shew great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And so here we see that Christ again saying not only is there false Christ, but there's going to be false teachers and they're going to deceive the very elect. Now, 
I believe when he talks about the very elect here, he's talking about the nation of Israel. You say, why do you believe that, Pastor? Because Matthew is written to the people of the Jews, written to the people of Israel, written to them, and, and they understand it. Now, it's for you and I, for all Scripture is profitable for us. We understand that, but it was actually written with a Jewish individual in mind as he is writing. And the Bible talks about the Jews being elect, talks about believers being elect, and talks about elect angels. So you, you, you don't need to get so twisted up on this election stuff because the Bible talks about different elects that are in the Scripture. But nonetheless, he says here that there are going to be those who would deceive the very elect. And, and we see that they are coming and we see them all around them. That many have followed others and have ended up not knowing that the true Christ has not yet come. I remember years ago uh, that there was a preacher in Arkansas that was preaching on the coming of Christ and had a great following of him. And he was trying to get everybody. And he taught people into selling their houses, uh, selling their cars, and going up on a mountain and dressing in white sheets waiting for the Lord to come. He didn't come. He didn't come. You say, well, how can intelligent people be so deceived? You know, deception is so very easy for the human. We have to be taking heed. We have to be on guard as to what we know that we are doing and understand this. People can be deceived so easily. But not only is that there is those false Christ, but go back and look at chapter 24. Look down at verse number 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, and ye shall see and, and, and see that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. But notice what it says, but the end is not yet. For a nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, what happened is really right after Christ ascended up to heaven, some of these things took place. There was earthquake. Uh, there were those that were rising against nation. Uh, Jesus of uh, the Old Testament prophesied that there is going to be coming to Israel a nation from afar. And they're going to speak a different language. And they're going to swoop down like an eagle. Well, who came from afar? The Romans. They spoke a different language than the Hebrew and the Chaldeans. And they came down like an eagle because every Roman soldier that had a seal, shield, had an emblem on that shield, and it was an emblem of an eagle. So the Bible, Old Testament, prophesied that. And so nations are going to rise against nations. But notice Jesus said, these are the beginning of sorrows. And the, uh, the end is not yet. There is, these things are going to happen all throughout history, man's history, from this side, from, uh, from the, the time of the resurrection of Christ. All of this, we have seen earthquakes. We have seen uh, a nation rise against nation. We have seen pestilence and famine and, and all of these things that are beginning to take place. And they've been going on, and the end is not yet. I prayed about what to preach this week, and several things came to my mind as I thought about this verse. It says very simply, you shall hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. This week, the doomsday clock. Anybody hear this on the news? The doomsday clock? The doomsday clock moved within 100 seconds of midnight. Now, it, it's a metaphorical uh, clock. It's not a real clock. And midnight is supposed to be the end of the world. Now, back in 1947, these scientists and these people came up with the doomsday clock. And it has been very close. It has been up to two minutes before midnight and it has been as far as way as 17 minutes before midnight. Different times throughout history, uh, when the Cuban crisis in the 60s took place, it got within uh, three minutes of the doomsday. Uh, others have looked at it real close. In, in 2019, uh, because of uh, the, the powers of North Korea and, and because of Iran and many of the, the doomsday clock got, came within two minutes. But now, it came out this week that they're saying it's within 100 seconds. And so what they're saying is 
You know, we're looking at it that the world could come to an end that quickly. Just that quickly. I mean, a minute and a half and ten seconds. And that, that's pretty close to that. What that tells us as believers is that the scientists and the political people and all these people that have set that up, they believe that there's an end coming and they believe that there's going to be a judgment. Now, isn't that interesting? Amen? We as God's people, we believe that there's an end coming. Amen? And we believe that there's going to be a judgment. And the world out there, they will not acknowledge that there's going to be a judgment of God and that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But let me tell you something, it's not here yet, but it is coming, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Also this week in the news, as I thought about these verses, I watched on television there across Africa that it showed billions and billions of Anybody else see it? What was it? Locusts. The locusts that were there. A particular kind of locusts. And they had films of it. And they were just flying. There. I mean, billions of them just going across Africa and eating and destroying everything in their sights. And people out there with their coats and blankets and stuff trying to fight them off. There's no need. I mean, fighting those things off. Can you imagine? And the Bible says right here that... Uh, and not only is it going to be wars, but notice it says famine and pestilence, the pests that are going to be there throughout southern United States, come up from uh, 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 South America through Mexico and into the southern United States and have been there for probably 50 years now. We have what they call fire ants. And those fire ants are just all over the place down there. And if you're not careful, your little kids can get into it. But you can get into it so easily. They're just a pestilence all over the place. There are pestilence everywhere. And the Bible talks about this across Africa and, and such. And, and so looking at this, we know that the doomsday plot, we know that there's pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. This past week, anybody see the news? Where did we have an earthquake close to us? Anybody see Vancouver Island? had an earthquake? Who had a major earthquake? Turkey. Turkey did. Turkey had a major one. But notice in divers places. I remember when I was in Bible college in Southern California, we had just prayed at the table for breakfast, and all of a sudden that table started to shake. And you, we thought maybe somebody was underneath it or something. But all of a sudden we had these little uh, light fixtures, kind of like chandeliers, but they were wrought iron and, and hanging from chain, and they were going this way and that way. And all of a sudden it was a concrete floor. It just went right up and right back down. It was an earthquake that came right through San Dimas there and just picked up the whole concrete just right up and right down. Well, I heard that if you're going to be a good leader, one day you've got to be a good follower today. Everybody else headed out the door. I just followed everybody out the door. I didn't want to say, the, the power poles out there were just rocking like that right there. That was an earthquake that's taken place many times in Southern California, earthquake. But notice what he says. Again, the end is not yet. And he says, all of these are the beginning of sorrow. These things are going to be taking place. And we look around and we see that more and more and more and more. And the Lord is coming very, very soon. Pastor, why are you bringing this out? Because the very next sign that He gives should disturb us. Notice if you would in verse number 12. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The love of many shall wax cold. Because iniquity. Now, for those who have been in our Bible study on, on Thursday night, when we see the word iniquity, we, take, we think of it as going away from God. The iniquity is their sin, is something that we commit deliberately. Iniquity is when we go away from God, when we turn from God. And because so many is turning from God, the, the, uh, because iniquity shall abound, I mean, over and over and over in our country and in our North America, we see so many people who once had an idea that there might be a God or that there is a greater power or something are completely turning away from that. 
It goes way back into the 50s and 60s where the, the battle took place over evolution being taught in the public schools, the government schools in our countries. And we see that now through the years that young people have no idea anything about God whatsoever. And because of evolution being taught and that man's an animal, we see very simply that the love of many shall wax cold of the unsaved. Unsaved people can be so heartless, so hateful, so so mean, so ungodly. You say, well, I know unsaved people that are good people. Yeah, there are good people. I know unsaved people that there are caring people. Yeah, there are caring people. But for the most part, you look around and you see how that there are more and more violence. And of course, they're saying, well, the answer is gun control or the answer is this. I mean, listen, if it's not a gun, it's a knife. If it's not a knife, it's a club. If it's not a club, it's their teeth. They, they, they bite people. Let me tell you, we are living in a time where that there are so many cold-hearted people that are unsaved and, 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 and that, that are, are just out to hurt people and to be mean and unkind to individuals. But here's the problem. Many Christians find ourselves cold-hearted. Many Christians who once said, man, I was on fire for God and I'm not as on fire as I used to be, but that's okay. That's okay. I, I, I was a lot younger then and I could do more for God. Listen, if you're still breathing, God's got something for you to do. Amen. If you're breathing, God has something for you to do. I walked up to two guys one time sitting on the porch there and, and they said, what do you want? I said, well, I saw you guys up here breathing so I thought I'd come up here and talk to you about the Lord. They laughed about it and I was able to talk to them about the Lord and stuff. But you know, we're breathing. We're alive. And if while we're alive and while we're breathing, God has a plan for your life. God did not save you to sit. He saved you and I to serve. And there is a place where we can serve. But I'm afraid that many have come cold-hearted. Many have gotten their hearts aware that they're comfortable in their Christian life. They're comfortable in their ways that they're living. And we need to be disturbed about this. He says, because iniquity shall abound. The going away, the, the departing from God, the love of many shall wax cold. There was that love. Remember what John, the beloved, said to the church at Laodicea? It in, in, uh, wasn't the church of Laodicea. It was the church of, I believe, Ephesus. The one that left their first love. They said, you had a great love and a great compassion and things for God and you left your first love. And then he tells you what you need to do. You need to repent and get back in love with Jesus. Amen. We need to make sure that we have a complete turnaround, a change of direction. Say, listen, I am going to love the Lord Jesus Christ. I am going to see Him work mightily on my behalf, my children's behalf, my grandchildren, and what God has for us as believers. These are signs of the time. These are the signs that Jesus points out. And then Paul comes along and verifies it. Look with me in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians is right after 1 Thessalonians. It's amazing how things like that happen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul is writing to the Christians at Thessalonica. These who once served idols but have turned to the living God. He said, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, that you be not soon shaken in trouble, neither by spirit, by word, by letter, as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. So somebody had written this church a letter, and it wasn't Paul, and they told them that you've missed the coming of the Lord. Now what did Jesus say? Jesus said that there were going to be some would come and say that here's Christ and there's Christ. And Somebody had written the church at Thessalonica and said, you know what? You missed the coming of the Lord. And they were very concerned about it. They were very concerned about it. So Paul is writing to him and he's telling them not to be shaken in mind and be troubled neither by spirit, by word, by a letter as from us. It wasn't from us, but it looked as if it was that the day of Christ is at hand. Notice verse 3. But let no man deceive you by any means. 
For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, uh, the son of perdition. He said, you know what? There is going to come a day, but that day has not come. And when it comes, there's going to be a falling away. There's going to be a departure from the faith. There are going to be those who are not going to be following after Christ. As well. Why? Because the love of many shall wax cold. Jesus brought this out. Paul vindicated it. But we go back to the Old Testament, to Daniel. There he is. Daniel chapter 12. Again, these are signs, even from the Old Testament, that were received of a mentioning in Daniel chapter 12. In verse 2, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting content. And they that be wise shall shine brightness of the firmament, they shall turn many to righteous as the stars forever and ever. But thou, listen to verse 4, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even in the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So here's one of the prophecies. He says, you know what, you need to take this book, you need to seal it up, you need to get it ready to be open at a different time. And that time is going to be when many run to and fro and not knowledge shall increase. Think of this prophecy. When we think of this sign that's coming, we have to think back. I saw, I didn't watch the whole thing, but uh, uh, YouTube came up and I started watching it. There was five, uh, five guys who spent the longest time in prison in the States. And the first guy was put in, and uh, I think it was 18, 1918 something, and he didn't get out till uh, 1978 or something like that, if I remember correctly. And he was the fifth longest guy in there. Uh, but then it showed everything that happened from about 1918 to the, I mean, uh, the the airplane, the cars, the uh, the 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 movement, the television, the internet, uh, everything that has happened. And as you look at it, how much it has increased more and more and more and more. Now, as a kid, I remember that every time we saw an airplane flying up the sky, we stopped and watched it. Now, this was back in the 50s. We didn't see them all the time until they put the airport uh, out about four or five miles from where we lived. We hardly ever saw an airplane up in the air, and we would just stop and look at the airplane. And now, airplanes fly over. People don't pay as much attention to them all because it's a common thing. When we were over in Germany, I mean, I, I loved it. I went out for a walk one evening. I saw a jet stream going this way, and a jet stream, and a jet stream, and, and jet streams. And, and there was no time that I could not see a jet stream around Europe because they were flying all different directions and everything. Uh, they were from, from Germany and stuff. And, and, and notice he's run to and fro. Uh, here in just uh, a couple of weeks, uh, uh, we're going to be on the other side of the world. My wife and I, and a couple of others, we're going to be all the way over the other side. To and fro. And then think of the increase of knowledge. Oh, man. The internet. I mean, now, I put my way, my phone is a computer. I remember the first computer it got. It was a, what was it, two, two, 286. Yeah, it was a 286. First computer, two floppy disks. And uh, it, it was the first computer, man, whoa, you know? And, and I even think that, that uh, what, what's his name with Apple? Uh, uh, Steve not Steve John. Steve. Uh, no, the other guy, not the Apple guy. But, uh, huh? No, no, not, not Apple, but Microsoft. Bill Gates. Bill Gates, when he made one computer, said, he, he stopped, he said, we don't need any more information than what will be on that computer. And that was nothing. I mean, now they got, and, and computers used to take up the whole room. Now they fit in our pockets and stuff. Increase of knowledge. It's a, there were a day that where people did not have more than a 10,000 word vocabulary. They didn't even have that much. Because you didn't talk about things that were there. I mean, things that are happening all around us. You just never... I mean, can you imagine somebody back in the 50s talking about, uh, uh, about some of the things that are happening today? 
it, it just wasn't even binary. Uh, uh, you know, the the uh, all the different things that are out there. It has increased and increased and increased. Look with me in Luke chapter twenty one. Luke twenty one. This gets back to us. Luke 21, if you would, verse number 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts should be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness, the cares of this life, and so that the day come upon you unaware. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that he may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. But I want us to go back. He says in verse 34, Take heed to yourselves. Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with serpenting. And certainly it's an overindulgence. It's overindulgence. You know, that's that's what happens to me, that's what happens to you. There are so much things that we can be involved with. Uh, there, there, there's a little phrase for uh, need to know what is it with the information. Need to know. It's a need to know. Everybody's got to know. You got to know what's going on. You got to look at your phone. You got to look on your computer. Uh, you get up in the middle of the night to go to the washroom. And you stop down and check your email. You know, people just have to know. I mean, we get so consumed. We get overindulged with everything that is going on there, and and, and, and it's 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 to to steal our hearts. You know, people say I liked it back when life was simple. Hey, life can be as simple as you want to make it. Life can be as simple as you want to make it. But with millennials and with young people and with adults and with seniors and stuff, we have overindulged ourselves. And notice what he says, take into yourself. That is, anytime your heart be overcharged with, with all the indulgences that are out there. And then he said drunkenness. Now, this drunkenness is not just the drunkenness of liquor or alcohol as such, but it is an intoxication of uncontrollable influences that are all around us. Where we are influenced this way and that way, our flesh, the pride of life, the pleasure of this world, where we allow so many things to captivate our hearts. God said, listen, keep your hearts, take, take heed. We are in a pleasure-loving world. We, we desire so much and so much there is to have. And it's at our fingertips. Money flows a lot different now than the way it used to flow. Yeah. I grew up, people talking about, man, if you didn't have the money, you were going to the poorhouse. Well, I didn't know where the poorhouse was. I saw some old shacks and cabins and stuff around. I thought that might have been the poorhouse. I don't know. But now it flows all so differently. And, and the, the poorest people in Canada are some of the richest people in the world. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying that we need to understand and be aware of these things. The drunkenness, the uncontrollable of under the influence of our flesh, of the pride of our life, of the pleasures of this world. And then notice what he says, the cares of this life. The cares of this life. We're caring more for this life than we are for the next life. This life, the Bible says, is as but a vapor. You come over, you come over a Mosquito Hill there, and you look out across Prince George, and you'll see the mill, and, the, and, and, and it used to be husky, I don't know what it is now, and you see the steam going up, and it shoots up two or three hundred feet up in the air. I mean, the steam just going right up. We lived in Abbotsford. We could open up our big picture window and we could look out and on a good, cold, clear day on the south side of Mount Baker, you could see the steam going up from that 
dormant volcano. So the steam would just go up as the sun was on the other side shining, and then it would just dissipate. Our life is here. Just, it is the span of a man's hand. But the cares of this world is robbing us of the blessings that we'll have in eternity. And we have to make choices on that. Let me have you turn back to the Old Testament one more time. Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 16. And verse number 49. Ezekiel 16, 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did they strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Now notice what was the sin of Sodom. Now we know what the sin of Sodom produced. It produced sodomy. It produced the homosexuals. It produced a lifestyle. But how did it go about producing that? It was, notice what it says, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. Here is a warning for me. Here is a warning for you. If we allow pride to pick up in our life, if we allow pride to say, well, I am a Canadian, I'm an American, I'm a, I'm a Texan, or whatever maybe, if we allow pride to say, I have a good job and I worked hard and I have accomplished so much of myself, if we allow pride to say, oh, I'm such an a intellectual person, my high IQ, I went through college with a four point. Oh, average, and, and we get all oh, prideful. I'm a, I'm a great driver. I'm a great uh, uh, sports player. I'm a, if we allow pride to get there, we better be careful. The fullness of bread. We look around. Our stores are filled. There was a time when people prayed, "Give us this day our daily bread," because there wasn't bread for tomorrow. The pride, the fullness of bread, and then the abundance of idols. We have got so much spare time now. Life has got so you, you say, well, no, I, I don't have any spare time. I am so busy. Well, look at what you're busy doing. Look at what you're busy doing. We have to be careful. We have to know that our society has been built on pride, fullness of bread, and the abundance of idleness. Well, let's go back to what Paul says. 1 Thessalonians. By the way, 1 Thessalonians is right before 2 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But in the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And notice if you would, verse number 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not of darkness, that ye should, excuse me, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. But ye are children of light and the children of day, and we are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Let us watch and be sober. What is he saying? He said, listen, the day of the Lord is coming and the time is coming in. It doesn't deal with 100 seconds before the doomsday. It deals with the Father deciding it's time for Jesus to come and to bring His children home. And we need to be sober. We need to watch. We need to be aware. We need to be aware with our children. We need to be aware with our relationship with our wives and husbands. We need to be aware with our work business. We need to be aware with our church. We need to be aware with our spiritual life. We are not to allow the cares of this world to give us no time for prayer. We're not to allow the uh, the, the drunkenness or, or what uh, the overindulgence to, to rob us from our prayer, our Bible study, our church, our soul winning, our visiting of other people. We need to realize now is the time that we need to be sober minded and to get out and to give the good word of Jesus Christ. Matthew 24.
and verse number 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. For they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. <coughs> He's coming again. Amen. One more verse. Actually, two verses, but one more turn place. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And ye shall receive the power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Verse 8. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and the othermost part of the earth. That's where you and I are. The othermost part of the earth. And when Jesus had spoken these things, while they, the disciples, beheld Jesus, was taken up, and a cloud received Him out of their sight. And while they were looked up steadfastly to he toward heaven, as He went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen Him go into heaven. As they watched Jesus levitated up and the clouds to seek Him out of their sight, He is going to come again. He's going to come in the clouds. Are you ready? Are you thinking soberly about your life, your wife's life, your husband's life, your children's life, life of those that are you. To think soberly. To think in reality. Oh, I know it's so easy to get involved with a game and lose your mind in a game or lose your mind in a television program or sit down and watch a movie to, to veg. I, I understand those things. But when they begin to captivate you, take heed and ask God to keep your heart from getting cold spend some time with Him. He and He alone will strengthen and He'll inspire for the glory of Himself. Dear Jesus, we love You. And we thank You for Your love for us. And Lord, if You was to come today, I would say Amen, Hallelujah, Glory to God. Lord, if it's next week, next month, next year, next decade as we begin a new decade I have no idea but Lord I do know that you have not left us alone you have given to us the Holy Spirit of God and for everyone who have repented of their sins and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and is a child of God we are children of the day and not of the night we are children of the light and we have the Holy Spirit of God to work in our hearts. It's up to us as individuals, Lord, to yield to Him and to be Spirit-filled. Help us, O God, in the name of Jesus. In Christ's name I pray. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed. The iniquity shall bow. The moving away from God is about to. Have you moved? Is your heart where it should be in your relationship? As the pianist comes to play a verse of invitation, it's very simple. Speak to the Lord right here, right now. If you want me to pray with you, I'll be so glad to pray with you. But if you need to build business with God, deal it over these next three moments. Piano tenderly, lovingly plays. God speaks to our hearts. If you want me to pray with you, I'm here. If you're here and you do not know Christ as your Savior, you do not know for sure that when you die that you'd go to heaven, but you would like to know. God's been working on you, dealing with you about your relationship of eternal salvation. Oh, it'd be a thrill for myself or my wife or another one of these workers that we have here to sit down with an open Bible and show you 
how you too may know Christ. Would you come?